Hello, this is Philip, technical director of Argentum Studio. I have noticed that there are mixed opinions in the community about which setting to use in the movie render pipeline. Since movie render grab was introduced and is now able to replace movie render queue, I decided to dig into it and clear up some of the common misconceptions. I will go over the major features so that anyone working in Unreal can understand when and why to apply each setting. I will talk about motion blur, anti-aliasing, warm-up frames, the new movie render graph and how to use them correctly for a cinematic production pipeline. I won't talk about other aspects for now such as translucency, depth of field or path tracing as it would be too difficult for me to cover in a single video. First of all, I want to thank all the authors of the most informative articles out there from the Epic Games team, Matt Hoffman, Sean Comley and others. All the links to the tutorials and articles I will leave in the description. Now let's start with the common approach using Movie Render Queue. Even though it's a legacy feature introduced in 4.26, it is still relevant. You can watch a full detailed explanation and a great example of using it for production with further compositing a nuke from the creator of this tool, Matt Hoffman. Before starting, enable the plugin and set the alpha to enabled or linear color space only in earlier versions under the project settings. Ok, let's go step by step and I remind you that I will explain everything only from the perspective of cinematic production, since this is my personal focus. Define the output settings for your needs. Next, add the deferred render. This is basically the same as what you see in the viewport. Add the color output node and adjust the OCIO transform as needed. By the way, you can also enable OCIO display in the viewport. William Foucher has a great explanation on everything about color science and other parameters that I won't repeat in this video. You can check his tutorial for more details. Add the game overrides. This forces the engine to use maximum scalability settings during render time. Be sure to check this box and set the mode to movie pipeline. Next is console variables. There are many misconceptions about this topic, especially on YouTube. All I can say is that this is a very specific option. You really don't need to experiment with it unless you really know what it does and how it contributes to the final output. Sivars can significantly affect your final pixel, not to mention render time. Here's a simple trick. If you want to be sure what's going on during the render, create a new Sivar collection asset. Here, enabling this option, you can track all the changes made in real time. For example, changing scalability settings from low to cinematic as well as pressing render local. Everything will be listed here. As you can see, everything is set by default to a maximum quality. You may have seen other people writing CVARs manually. You really don't need to do that. If there was a really significant CVAR, it could change everything. I'm pretty sure Epix or the community wouldn't have missed it. Anti-aliasing and motion blur. Now let me contribute my own thoughts about AA methods. Starting from the top, we have spatial and temporal sample count. First, decide whether you want motion blur in your scene or not. The only way to control the amount of motion blur is in the post-process volume by changing the motion blur amount parameter. Not the hours, they do nothing. Don't ask me why, I would like to know myself. Not everything is documented by Epic, so we have to verify it ourselves. If these become useful in 5.5 or above, please let me know. You can also use camera settings, which will always overwrite any others. If you decide to turn motion blur off, you want to use special sample count, since it is faster. It will jitter your camera on the same frame and increase the overall quality. If you want motion blur on, increase the amount, but think of the slider as a film camera shutter angle. Value set to 1, same as 360 degrees full frame open. Default 0 0.5 equals to 180 degrees, which is common for movies. Now, you want to use temporal sample count. It will tick your engine forward. What does this mean? Think of it like splitting a frame into subframes you are actually dividing a single frame into images, with the sample count defining the exact number of slices between each frame. 
end. It will only slice the portion where your shutter angle is open and skip the portion where it is closed, which, as already said, is controlled by the amount parameter. The diagram shows the time steps passed to the simulation. In our case, we have half of the frame open and 9 temporal samples will split into 9 subframes and evaluate each accordingly. Another thing to keep in mind, that by default the engine uses a frame center shutter timing method. Using an odd number of samples ensures there is an actual subframe on the keyframe, helping sudden changes in motion render more cleanly. But it's not mandatory. If you want further control over the camera shutter timing, add a camera setting and here you can choose what type of shutter timing to evaluate. Be aware that some simulation types can have issues with this kind of irregular stepping and may behave unpredictably. For example, grid simulations depend on every parameter. The motion blur amount. the temporal sample count and the shutter timing. Since these values determine the time steps and how the simulation is evaluated for each frame. Now, I don't recommend mixing special with temporal sample count. There isn't any advantage. By increasing them both, you may still get increased quality in anti-aliasing only if the method is set to none, but you will lose the extra motion blur blending. Do not mix them with the deferred rendering path. Use either all temporal or all special. Next, anti-aliasing methods. Whenever you change it, MRQ may give you an error. The temporal anti-aliasing has diminishing returns above 8 samples and vice versa for none. This is actually true only for methods set to TAA. You can ignore this warning for other methods. I personally don't recommend use TAA at all, unless there is a visual reason to do so. Comparing temporal super resolution and none, I don't notice a big difference at first glance. I personally trust TSR more, since Unreal Engine is primarily a game engine, and many rendering features as Lumen rely on this method. But known definitely works better in smoothing thin pieces intersecting over bright materials and coupling geometries with small details. Another thing to keep in mind, increasing sample count will not save you from noise, flickering or other issues in your final image. It may help a little, but at the cost of much longer render times, which you want to avoid in production. For that, you have to adjust your actor settings, shadow samples from the light sources, post-process volume, global settings for lumen, reflections, AO, global illumination, or consider using special CVARs for hair strands or other systems. By the way, we created a blueprint tool for rendering rooms at maximum quality using advanced CVARs. If you are interested, check the link in the description. Warm-up frames. Sometimes you may encounter blurring on the first frame of your shot. This is because many engine systems require more than one frame to initialize properly. In other words, frame 0 has no history and may render incorrectly. That's why you want to warm up the engine before the actual render starts. You may also notice this happening, for example, when you are assembling your scene. Effects like Lumen Global Illumination often progressively adapt to a changing screen size or light conditions. Here is a great explanation from an article by Piranha Soaps. Let's explore where this can be useful. In general, you want to enable these two checkboxes to allow all the systems to warm up. The first checkbox will use your camera cut, which you should extend by the desired amount. And the second checkbox will send these frames to the GPU and discard them before frame zero. Motion blur cannot be emulated with warm-up frames. In production, you cannot expect correct motion blur for the first and the last frame if there is no animation data before and after your sequence bounce. You need to extend your animation keyframes to get proper motion blur results. Other two scenarios. First, maybe you have a simple scene or creating a preview and you don't need to warm up. I still recommend using at least this option enabled. It won't end any time at render, but it does help to prevent some unexpected artifacts. 
Second scenario is that you may have a Niagara system or Chaos Club simulation or animated material and you wanted to settle before the first frame. You can use engine warm-up count for this case without extending your camera cut. What about render warm-up count? I never use it myself since I never seen any benefit and it seems it is indeed a legacy feature that does not work anymore. Now, I want to demonstrate the engine warm-up count as well as camera cut with a simple setup using Niagara system on CPU and GPU with additional system lifecycle duplicates in the sequencer. I have set the spawn rate to 5 units at 25 FPS. So it means that every 5 frames a new particle is born. Be sure to offset the lifecycle track to minus 1 so it could be initialized properly. Or you will get an error. So I will move it one frame back and let's check the different parameters with the warm-up frames. First, everything is disabled and the lifecycle track is at minus one frame. Going to the fifth frame, we can see that one particle has been generated as expected. Next, whether we use EFC or CCV, we can determine how our system with no lifecycle track will evaluate. To offset Niagara with lifecycle track, we can simply drag them in the timeline back to frame minus 26 and we have similar results as engine warm-up frames or camera cut. This is a basic example, but applicable to other simulations as well. Applying all this knowledge to the production pipeline, my advice is, if you have complex scenes, test your simulations and animations as early as possible with all the complex stuff first and then build up detail from there. Decide and define motion blur you want to use for each scene and each shot. Check if temporal samples affect your simulations and set it to a constant value if it does. Keep in mind about camera shutter timing option. Also, decide the warm-up frames you want to use and adapt your simulations accordingly. This way you will have as few unpredictable results as possible. Now let's move to the new movie render graph. Developers assure us there is no difference in the final output between MRQ and MRG, since all parameters are the same. I won't explain how to use MRG, it was already covered in detail. This is personally my new favorite tool, since it is really flexible, procedural and simple to use. Now let's take a look at the difference between warm-up settings. Emulate motion blur. This is for real-time rendering mostly, not reliable for production. Don't check this unless you need draft previews. This option can actually emulate motion blur, but only if you have your AA samples at 1. Num warm-up frames. Same as camera cut warm-up plus render warm-up frames. But you don't need to extend it manually. Just set the value and the camera cut will extend automatically. This will also work for simulations and Niagara systems. Here is a very important thing to remember. AA samples will also affect your warm-up frames. When using special samples, each warm-up frame renders with the full sample cut. With temporal samples, they only evaluate during the last 5 warm-up frames, which can affect grid simulations with no live cell track enabled. And the last thing I want to mention is nested sequences and master sequences. I still don't know if it is possible to render one whole sequence from the master and get all the warm-ups and angles correct without flickering, hair bending and you know. I will continue my R&D on this. It can be very useful when working in one scene with multiple shots in the same environment, light and time conditions. This is it. I tried to collect all the recent information and make it as simple as possible. But that's not all. There is a super feature that I'm eager to test myself in the latest versions of Unreal Engine. The Quick Render feature. It basically allows you to render stills or sequences using your viewport camera and quick presets from RG you saved earlier. Check out this great tutorial again from Sean Comley, special thanks to him since most of the information here came from his guide. Now that's it. Thank you for watching and stay tuned. I will continue to explore and share all the tricks we use in the studio. At Argentum we understand that real-time rendering can be complex, but we believe that it can be more profitable to use compared to traditional DCC renderers.